pleasure in finding fault. And I cry out to God, why, why do I do this, Father? What is it in me that makes me compare myself favorably to other people? What is it in me that, that I actually like when I see faults in other people? Why is there delight in my heart? And now listen, this is not this attitude that Jesus confronts. You know, sometimes we can have this kind of attitude of, of we hear a sermon or we read a passage, we think of other people that need to apply this, or we read about these Pharisees that Jesus is rebuking, and we think, gosh, those knuckle-headed Pharisees. But this attitude that he is confronting this morning was not some, some issue that was confined to the Pharisees back then. It wasn't a unique thing that they were guilty of. Rather, it has troubled genuine Christians throughout the history of the church, and it still troubles us today. One of the greatest, if not the greatest preacher of the 20th century, a man that I've read a lot of, Martin Lloyd-Jones, says this. He says, I suppose there is nothing in the whole of the Sermon on the Mount that comes to us with such a sense of conviction as this statement. How guilty we all are in this respect. It is a painful subject that Jesus raises, it's a painful subject, but a very necessary one, and we ignore it to our own peril. I think that's exactly right. It's a warning to us this morning. Remember what Jesus just said previously, judge not and you will not be judged. You see, one of the ways that Jesus strongly discourages us from judging is by telling us about another type of judging. Look with me at verse 37 again. It says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Here is the second type of judging. There's a number of different types of judging that he's talking about here. And this is the second type and it's God's judging. And God's judgments are righteous. You know, sometimes people have taken what Jesus says here to take it like, if you judge, then others will judge you. If you're a judgmental person, other people will be judgmental too. And while, while, you know, like like what you dish out, you can expect to get back, right? And while that may be true about the way that people relate, if you're judgmental like that with me, I'm going to be judgmental with you. I will show you who can outjudge who here, buddy. And that may be true, but that's not what Jesus is speaking of here. He is speaking of God's judgment. And you might say, now wait a minute. I thought that now that I'm in Christ, there is no more judgment for me from God. I am under grace and no judgment. And the New Testament would tell you, well, yes and no. You see, there are different types of judgment. It depends on which type of judgment you're talking about, because there's really three types of judgment. There is, there is the judgment of God that he will render for every person regarding his standing before God as either condemned or forgiven. It is a final and eternal judgment for the one that has, and for the one who has put their faith in Christ, that judgment completely forgiven is already rendered. It is complete. It is definite. It is done. But the New Testament also speaks of another type of judgment, actually two other types of judgment. It speaks of God's temporal judgment, the judgment of discipline to which we are, which we are subject in this lifetime precisely because we're God's children. It says that God disciplines those he loves, right? It is God's discipline, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, when we are judged like this, we are being disciplined of the Lord, and that can take a variety of forms. We should not be unaware, brothers and sisters, that God deals with his people in this way in love, in love for our good. He shapes us, he molds us, he disciplines us. And the New Testament also speaks of a third type of judgment of God, and that's the judgment of rewards. When we shall meet him, we shall see him face to face, and a judgment will take place regarding our deeds done in this lifetime. And so in light of these second two judgments, we are to be careful how we live here and now, knowing that there are implications forever. So here's the point. We are made right with God by faith. We have assurance of our salvation And yes, we are subject to judgment here in this life and after this life. And so we are responsible before God for our thoughts and our attitudes and our words and our actions as we relate to other people. This means that if we are self-righteous in our judgments toward others, that we will be judged by our words, by our thoughts, and by our attitudes toward others. 
You think of the, the parable that, that John brought up last week about the, uh, the unforgiving servant, the man who went and had this great debt before the king. And he goes and he cries out for mercy because it was more than he could pay. And the king has mercy and forgives him. And then this man goes out and, and shows no mercy to other people who owe him money. He grabs them by the collar and says, you pay me what you owe me. It's right. And he wasn't wrong. He wasn't wrong. But in light of that attitude, the king calls him back in and he requires full payment and the man could not pay it. And so the way that we relate to others, that's how we're judged. So one mistake clearly to be avoided, Jesus says, is our relating to others is this self-righteous judgmentalism, self-righteous judgmentalism. That's what we talked about last week. But there's another mistake on this other side that we want to touch on just briefly, and it's right here in the text in verse, in verse 39. Look with me here. It's the failure to exercise discernment at all. Jesus says, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? So this is, this is Jesus who just said, Ju judge not, right? And then he talks about the judgment of God. And then he talks about blind men. So how do we discern who the blind men are? He's not talking about literal blind men, but he's talking about blind guides. Well, how do we know who the blind guides are? We have to judge. We have to discern. We have to figure that out. He goes on talk later to talk about you know, inspecting you know, fruit and seeing you know, what kind of a tree it is by the fruit that it produces. And so the danger here is that maybe in our desire to, be a, to avoid being guilty of wrongful judgment is that we might not exercise any discrimination at all. And Jesus says, no, we must not do that either. Jesus is purposely using absurd language here. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Of course not, is the automatic expected answer. Nobody would say anything else. They're going nowhere good. Do you want to be like that? He says, everyone will become like their teacher and therefore, don't follow blind guides. If your teacher's blind, you're in trouble. What Jesus is saying is that you need to be aware of that at times. You need to see that and to discern that. He goes on in the next section, you know, as I said, to talk about evaluating the tree by its fruit. And what he's warning us to is to consider the lives of those we follow. To, he says in Hebrews 13, to consider the outcome of their lives. And so Jesus does call us to exercise discernment in these types of things. And sometimes this type of discerning judgment needs to be exercised in the church. You think of uh, the story, you know, in, uh, in the book of Corinthians where Paul talks about a man who is so persistent in his sin, he said, remember, listen, it's gone too far. It's gone too far. No longer appeal to that man, but throw him out of the church. Hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his body. And another point, Paul says in Titus chapter 3, warn a divisive person once, then warn him again. After that, have nothing to do with him. So what is Jesus' point? You must exercise discernment. You must recognize certain spiritual realities and respond appropriately to them. Okay, now, all that, having put up these boundaries, having framed it in these different cautionary instructions of one extreme to avoid on the one hand and another extreme to avoid on the other. Now he gets to the heart of the matter in verses 41 through 42. Let me read that again. Look with me in verses 41 and 42. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that is in your eye when, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Jesus doesn't mince words. His words are very pointed, aren't they? He's being highly ironic, almost sarcastic because we need to be confronted on this. We need to be confronted on this. Oh, how we need this instruction. I mean, this situation occurs so frequently, so devastatingly, so pathetically in our relating to one another. I mean, our, our natural tendencies are perfectly captured by this illustration. And the absurdity of our natural tendency is put on display. Jesus asked two very penetrating questions in verses 41 and 42. Why do you judge your brother but miss what needs judgment in yourself? And how can you pretend to help your brother when you have such a debilitating handicap yourself? By asking these questions, Jesus introduces the fourth type of judgment that appears in this passage, and that's the judging of ourselves. We see this in verse 42. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. 
He's calling us to self-evaluation, to self-awareness, to self-reflection. And what is this log? The, log, the word used for log here is uh, used in other places throughout the New Testament as the main beam of a house. It's a big, it's a large protruding object. So it's, a, it's an absurd you know, picture. If you picture that in your minds, you have this man who is walking around with a literal beam coming out of his eye, and he comes over and he says, you, let me, let me get close enough to you, and he's swinging the beam around, and he's trying to get close to get that speck out of the other person's eye. It's comical. It's a strong point. So what is the log? I think typically when we read this passage or hear this, we assume that it's just, just some type of sin. It's just kind of different for everybody. It's some unnamed sin, any number of things, but it's some, it's some sin that is in this person who is trying to uh, do the judging of this other person. But I, as I read it this week, I, I thought about that. I read a lot of books and articles on this and trying to figure out, you know, what is this sin? Um, and a number of people just, just made that point. There's just kind of some unnamed sin. And that no matter what it is, you have to always consider that your sin is always the log, no matter what it is. Uh, so one person said if, you know, if, if, if two guys are standing there and one guy hits the other one uh, because he made a sarcastic remark and you made the sarcastic remark, you have to consider that the sarcastic remark, that's, that's the big log and getting hit. And I just thought, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that makes the most sense of this passage. And so... <laughs> not absolutely sure about this, so if you, if you believe differently, I, I don't think it changes it ultimately, but it makes this passage so much clearer to me. I can think, I think that it's what Jesus is talking about right here in this passage. I think the context defines for us what this log is. It's not just some un, un, general unnamed sin, but I think that it's actually you know, this sin of self-righteousness. I believe the log is the sin that Jesus is talking about here. It's what we talked about last week. It's the sin of self-righteous superiority that fosters a critical spirit, a fault-finding mentality that enjoys, that takes pleasure in finding fault in other people. I think that's the log. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. I think Jesus says that self-righteousness, that's the log, and that needs to go. I hate it, and I want you to hate it. Let's get rid of it. So how do we get the log out? I want to get just really very practical here. Now, there's all sorts of good, helpful resources out there, but, but three very practical, very simple steps that I want to recommend to you this morning. First, just assume that this is present in your life somehow. The thing about self-righteousness is that we are often blind to it. That's why he uses the illustration of blind guides is because we can be blind to our own self-righteousness. You may have a vague awareness of it. We may be completely blind to it, as Jesus says here, but this is the natural instinct of every human heart, and it's difficult to root out and to put to death. So first, friends, I just want you to assume that it's there to some degree. Second, identify more specifically how and where and in which relationships it shows up. Take your relationships Maybe you've got relationships that are coming to mind right now. And that's the Lord just saying, yep, that's, that's one, probably. And just consider which relationships you find this turning up in more often. Take a survey of your relationships as to which ones a spirit of judgmentalism is present. Which one do you find yourself judging this person on a regular basis? Maybe you're judging them for their self-righteousness. Isn't that fun? Specifically consider this. Okay, here's how you can do it. Read the description of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, love is patient, love is kind, love does not boast, it does not anything. Read through that list and test to see if those qualities or something very different shows up in those relationships. What do you see coming out of you when you think about that person? Or here's another way that you can assess it. Think about what motives you assign to people. Consider your attitude toward others. You probably know which relationships to look at as part of your assessment. They're the ones you're thinking of right now. Maybe draw somebody else in. Maybe draw in, if you're married, you bring in your spouse. Or you bring a trusted friend. You bring them in and you ask them what they see. Actually do that, all right? And here's the thing is that 
you want to make it easy for people to, to do that. Self-righteous people are difficult to approach. They're difficult to point things out to, especially when they're blind to it. And so if you want to, if you can take it and just assume that it's there, go to your spouse, go to a trusted friend on a, in a moment when you're not like stressed out or anxious or tired and say, what do you see in me? We should ask open-ended questions. We don't want to lead them. Hey, you don't think I'm self-righteous, do you? <laughs> how, do you how do you respond to that? But here's what you do is you say, here's a relationship that I find myself being very critical of this person. I'm very aware of their faults. I see no grace. I'm only aware of areas that they fail. Tell me, do you think I'm seeing clearly? Don't lead them. Make it easy for them. Get a sober assessment of the log in your life and face the truth about yourself, which leads to step three. Confess. We want to own up. We want to say yes. We want to say what God says. There is a big, rotten log in my eye. We want to say that. We want to own that. We want to say, you know what? I have been self-righteous. I have been judgmental. I have not been fair to you or charitable or caring to you. Listen, this friend, this friends, this kind of humble honest self-judgment, this will begin to chip away and to chop away and to, and to saw away at that log that's in your eye, and it will get smaller. And with the help of the Spirit of God, it can be removed from your life. That's the hope that we have. That's the promise that we have. Jesus doesn't say, remove the log from your eye, but I know it's impossible. He empowers what he commands, doesn't he? So first, attend to yourself, and then, this is the order, as Jesus says, first, remove the log. First, attend to yourself, and then, here's the good news, then you will be, get, be able to see clearly. Then, you'll be able to help your brother or your sister, and there will be times, there will be times that come along where your brother and sister need your help. There are times, friends, that I need your help, where John will need your help. There are times where others around you are going to need your help. And so before we rush into that, we want to make sure that we're seeing clearly. So the order is very important. They need your help, not your self-righteous judgment. It's very easy to just go around and pointing out, sinner, I know, you know you're self-righteous and you're angry and you drive too fast and I don't like the way that you're sitting looking at me right now. And you know, we can do that, right? But that's not what people need. People need us to come alongside them, not as an accuser, because there's an accuser in the Bible, and he's not somebody good. Okay, we don't want to play the part of the accuser. We want to play the part of the doctor. We want to come alongside somebody. We want to sit with them, and we want to offer them medicine. We want to say, I think, I think there's help for you in this moment. They need your help. When they get something in their eye, there's this, you know, this speck. It's not nothing. Okay, I mean, we, we can take that analogy and we can read it the wrong way, and we think, well, basically there's this log, and then there's nothing. It's really nothing that's in this person's eye. The speck here, the word you know, used for speck here, it's something painful. It's something uncomfortable. It's something that is distorting their vision, and they do need it removed. You ever get, you ever get something stuck in your eye? It happens to me all the time because I don't think rightly about things, and I'm forgetful, and so every time I pull out my weed eater, I know that I'm supposed to put on the safety glasses, but I'm prideful. And I have this big gas-powered weed eater that just throws stuff everywhere. You don't have like one of those a little electric. If you do have one of those, God bless you. They're, they're good. They're fine. But mine throws things everywhere. And so every time I go to use mine, I, I need to put on the safety glasses, and I don't because I'm prideful. And I think, no, I don't need, you know, I'm a man. I don't need safety glasses. And then inevitably, it's not long before I'm, you know, I'm sitting there doing my thing, and then something, you know, just kind of gets up there, and I've got this, my eye starts to water, and then my boys are making fun of me, and then my wife has to help me because I'm crying. And I'm in pain, and sometimes I just, I can't see to get it out of me. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing this thing and trying to, you know, but it's, it's there, and she needs to pull it out. And if you ignore it, um, it could be damaging, right? If you just leave it there, you're like, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it'll go away on its own. It can be damaging. Maybe it'll go away, but it's usually damaging. It gets in there, it gets under your eyelid, and I've got doctors and nurses in this room, and they're, they're saying, yep, yeah, it's, it's bad. Get it out. Um, and it blurs your vision. It distorts reality, right? And so when you're trying to get something done, like taking care of your weeds, you have to stop what you're doing in order to take care of that speck. It interrupts your life. 
Sometimes God gives us those things to say, I need you to stop and deal with something here. I know you have all these things that you want to do. I think that your life, I know you have a plan for your life right now, and I'm going to throw something in the midst of it to force you to stop and deal with the speck. So it takes you out of commission for a little while. So it's not a small thing. You can't ignore it. And when there's sin in our lives, even little sins, but it's only after we've exercised this self-judgment that we're able to be in a position to help with this last type of judgment, this charitable, caring, careful judging of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 42 says, first take the log out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. It's in fact, only after having attended to self-judgment that our brother and sister is even going to be willing to receive our caring judgment as we come alongside them. But coming from one who has judged himself, coming from somebody who has already dealt with himself, coming from somebody who comes and says, hey, let me tell you about some ways that God's been working in my heart. You know, when they come with that kind of posture, then that person with a speck, then they can receive it. Even, they might even welcome it. They might even say, I'm, I'm so glad that you can help me with this. Thank you so much for coming alongside me right now. I know it's difficult to do. Jesus tells us that once we remove our logs, then we will see clearly to get that speck out, to help our friend get that bothersome piece of whatever it is to get out. Then we will see clearly. Remember, this is an illustration. It's intended to get a point. Okay, the illustration illustrates a point that Jesus is making. So what does Jesus mean when he says that you'll see clearly? He simply means that you're going to be able to do it well. You're going to do it well. You know, a doctor who is coming in squinting at you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably like, you know, but if he's coming in and he sees clearly, I'm going to trust him and he's going to be able to do his work well. You'll be able to exercise this caring judgment of others well. So what is necessary for you to be able to help people, for you to be able to care for people this way, for you to be able to come alongside and exercise this type of caring and charitable judgment? First, all right, let me, I want to recommend two things. Okay, first is the right posture the right attitude. Namely, you want a sincere desire for the good of the other person. Remember a a dear friend of mine that said, I never confront a person about their sin unless I'm really desiring their good in in my heart. If I'm not praying for their good, I'm not bringing up any of their sin. I'm not bringing up, I'm not confronting. If I don't have faith for them to change, I'm not going to communicate their shortcomings and their faults because I I don't trust my own heart in those moments. We want the right posture. We want a sincere desire for the good of the other person. We want to care for them. We want their good. To not care about that painful and debilitating speck in their eye, to pretend that it doesn't matter, and to make no attempt to help them is not love. We want to desire their good. That's the attitude of your heart, and it's absolutely necessary to doing this well. And secondly, you need skill. You need more than just a good attitude. You need skill. What is needed is gentleness and patience and kindness, a gracious disposition that, has only, that only shows up when one has gone through the self-humbling process of self-judgment. Listen, there's a reason that Jesus uses this illustration with the eye that there's no organ in your body as sensitive as the eye. If you get too close to the eye, it just kind of automatically shuts in self-protection. I have five sons, and they put this to the test all the time. They, they come up and say, let me see if I can get close to you. Don't blink. Don't blink. And it, it, it just does. I, I, I'm a dad. I want to impress my kids, but it, I can't. It doesn't work. Transfer that to the spiritual realm. Jesus is taking kind of a silly analogy and making a very serious spiritual point about it. This is what he's done. This is what he's saying. Listen, you are about to handle a person's soul. You're going to touch the most sensitive part of that person. You are dealing, as David Pallison says, you are dealing with the fine china of people's lives. And when you have a relationship with someone, when, you, when, you ha- when you're invited to speak into that part of their lives, I mean, it is literally like handing them, you know, your fine china and saying, please, please be gentle. Please, please, please be soft with that. So we want to be humble and sympathetic. 
compassionate. We want to be generous and charitable as we speak the truth in love so that we can actually help, not just rebuke, not just unleash our wrath, but we want to actually help our brother or sister. And friends, the only way that you're going to be like that is if you yourselves have experienced the tender, compassionate, generous, and sympathetic loving hands of Christ on your soul. Do you know that? Have you had that experience of Jesus coming and being gentle with you and helping you, patient with you? As you come to him in your own sin and as you experience his healing, then you're able to turn around and help heal others. Listen, when you have someone caring for you like that, you not only know that they're speaking speaking the truth to you in love, but you actually thank them for it. Thank you, brother. This is so helpful. It's so helpful for you to come along and help me in this way. How profoundly grateful I am for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Aren't you? Pretty much daily, I stand judged by this passage. As I prepared for this morning, and I read these words, I am, I mean, I'm just aware of how far I fall short, how much I need this passage, how grateful I am for the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been purchased by his blood and awarded to us, imputed to us through faith, so that I don't need to despair when I'm made aware of my failures, my shortcomings, and my sin. I don't need to despair because I can be grateful that I am I am that which Christ has declared me to be. And progressively more and more, he is enabling me to live for him and to live like him. Good news is the log is actually getting smaller. It does work. He is faithful to finish what he's begun. How amazing is this enabling grace of Christ. It makes me want to relate to others in a way that makes much of Christ and that puts the gospel on display for all to see. Isn't that what we want? To know the love of Christ, to so be shaped by God's affection toward us that all that we can do, like the tree that is well-nourished, well-cared for, it automatically produces that kind of fruit. Psalm 1, you know these words. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of his comfort, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. He prospers in all that he does. That's what we want, is to be so near to God, to so experience that refreshment, that nourishment, that care from him, that the fruit flows. So let's draw near. Let's draw near to him. Would you pray with me? Well, Father in heaven, we do draw near to you this morning. Father, we're so grateful for your mercy toward us. So grateful for the love that you've shown us in Christ Jesus that covers my sin and that of every person in this room who has put their trust in you. Father, I pray that we would rejoice in the fact that in Christ your judgment with reference to our standing with you has been rendered. It is certain, and we need have no fear. Father, I pray that you would help us to be sobered by the fact that it is your intention that we live for your glory. And in those places, Father, where our lives are not representing the transforming power of your gospel and the character of Christ, I pray that in your mercy, Father, that you would continue to work in our lives in such a way as to bring us into greater and greater conformity to your Son, Father. We want to be like Jesus. So, Father... We pray in this area of relating to one another where every one of us feels to some degree, we all feel the pinch of this passage. 
God, help us to respond. I pray, Father, for every person in this room, Father, for children, the youngest age, all the way up to the oldest person in this room, God, that there be a particular application for us today. That we might humbly acknowledge before you our own desperate need for your righteousness. And God, that you would help us to be careful, loving, and charitable in one another's lives for our good and for theirs. Father, we thank you for your word. We turn to you now in song. We pray this in Jesus' name.